Welcome back to the New York Fishing Podcast, where the thrill to the cast meets the hearts of New York's waters. As Thanksgiving approaches, let's dive into the parallels between this festive season and our fishing adventures. Thanksgiving, folks, is more than just turkey and trimmings. It's a celebration of bounty and what speaks of bounty more than our vast, vibrant oceans. They're our playground, our pantry, providing us not just with sport, but substance, much like the first Thanksgiving feast, the crisp morning air, the calm waters, the anticipation as you cast your line, mirroring the excitement of Thanksgiving preparations. Each catch is a story, a victory, a moment of gratitude, much like each dish on our Thanksgiving table. This year, as we gather, let's raise a toast to the waters that connect us, to the fish that challenge and fascinate us. Let's be thankful for the pulls on our lines and the fishtails that follow, for the camaraderie among anglers and for the ocean's gifts that just keep on giving. So here's to tight lines and tall tales this Thanksgiving. Remember, every cast is a story waiting to unfold, and every catch a reason to be thankful. Stay hooked and have a fishtastic Thanksgiving. Today we embark on a journey not just across the sparkling waters of New York, but through a tale of resilience, community, and the unbreakable spirit of a fisherman. Our story begins with a party boat, not unlike many boats that dot our shores, but with a destiny that almost slipped away into the depths. Picture this, a fledgling business a boat bobbing on the waves, more often anchored by despair than by hope. There were days, many days, when the phone laid silent, as still as a sea on a windless day. Advertisements and papers seemed like messages in bottles, lost in an ocean of indifference. But then, amidst the struggle, an engine fails, a transmission blows. It seems like the final anchor dragging down the dreams to the seabed. But as every seasoned fisherman knows, the ocean is full of surprises. Enter Norris.com, a beacon on the digital horizon, a simple post, a few pictures of a triumphant blackfish trip, and suddenly the tide began to turn. Within minutes, the silent phone became a siren song of hope. Calls poured in, bookings filled the calendar, and the boat that once drifted in despair now sailed on waves of success. This wasn't just a turnaround. It was a transformation powered by a community of passionate anglers united by a shared love for the sport. And a tradition was born the Norris.com Charter, a gathering of enthusiasts from behind their scenes, casting lines as friends, not just usernames. Together, they wrote chapters of unforgettable memories, a bounty full of catches, and of bonds forged over the thrill of the catch and the peace of the sea. So as we navigate through this episode, we will dive deeper into the story of the Celtic Quest. I'd like to welcome a very good friend of mine and a great guest and a great fisherman and a great person from a great family. I guess all around the guy is great. I'm speaking to Desi O'Sullivan from the Celtic Quest. I called Celtic Quest years ago. Frank Delecki called it Celtic Quest. Which one is it, by the way? Whichever one you prefer. (laughs) Stay with Celtic. All right, so he's with the Celtic Quest. This is a man who, Desi had a lot of foresight, and that's not because he recognized Norris right in the beginning. 
there were a lot of things that I learned about Desi. First time I ever went fishing with him. And we were mohawking these monster blackfish. And I mean mohawking them. It was crazy. And all he was doing was, he wasn't telling us all to throw all our fish back, but he wanted us to throw a lot of fish back because he was like, we got to save these fish. And this was at a time when there was a lot of fish. And I, in, in my mind, I knew he was right. And I'm going to say, we look at what happened today and Des, you were right. So talk to me a little bit about black fishing today. Gosh, I, I miss those days, George. <laughs> oh. you, you and I had some absolutely amazing trips together. When, and I, some of my fondest memories are when you bring the staff from the Northeast.com out, the, oh, all the yeah. moderators. We had some absolutely epic trips. It was amazing. We were really fortunate to be fishing together at that time when the eastern Long Island Sound particularly was very untapped there wasn't a lot of fishing pressure and all the potting and everything hadn't taken its toll yet so yeah we went we used to go out there and have some unbelievable trips and definitely always thought ahead to say we really have to protect this resource which unfortunately was not protected nearly well enough and today it's a far cry from what it used to be yeah. And yeah. we were blessed to have those amazing trips, and I'll, I'll cherish them for the rest of my life. I remember one in particular with you and your team. And the couple of days before you came out, I had found a new wreck, a really small wreck. It was about the size of a car, maybe. Just a little tiny piece. And I had quickly tried it, and the 25 rods went off instantly. And I said, oh, geez, okay, let's save this one. <laughs> because we already had a ton of fish in the boat. Yeah on that particular trip. So I was like, I know George is coming out with all the staff and you guys were, were great customers of ours and great friends. And I said, you know what, this is going to be special drop for that trip. And we had already had a great day. My customers have plenty of fish. So we wrapped up, we went home and I remember going out with you and we wailed on them. We had, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of blackfish and we had so many that we ended up throwing back like 50 or 100 keepers at the end of the day. Just oh, I, catching I'll them. never forget <laughs> that. Remember? We were just like, oh, God, I don't know. It was a beautiful day. We didn't want to go home. But, yeah, you and I were just like, oh. and, and it was unbelievable. And I think back to those days. Now I, I can't even, the, the thought of of catching that much that you could be releasing them like that. Or I just, it was a I knew it was special what was happening in those Me years, too. but I didn't. You wish you could go back in time and really, truly appreciate it even more because those trips were so epic. You just and never I don't knew. Know, I don't know if we'll ever see it again, and I cherish them. They're some of my fondest memories fishing with you and your team and the good old days. There's... Now it's just uh, another fish story. No, no. You but... know what? The truth <laughs> is... <laughs> So many of us feel that way, right? It was so special. Northeast was new. The internet was new. You were new. I remember going out. You had that smaller boat in the beginning. And here we are. Think about the people that were on that boat, right? So we had Killsong. We had Alberto. We had Johnny Skinner. We had myself. We had Chris Bees. We had... One Ralphie, we had every Sharpie, I think, that there was on Long Island. And they loved fishing with you. And together, the camaraderie, it, it, those were special days that will be tough to ever repeat. But again, I'm going to stress, I remember you saying, we got to keep this fishery. We, we got to let a lot of these fish go. Granted, we were, great, we were way over the limit. But the fact is, I fish with you and we fish with you many times. And <laughs> you always, you knew, and we all knew, how much could it take. But uh, those were great days. Yeah, it was a remarkable time. And like I say, I, I was just super fortunate to be starting my business 
with such an incredible fishery to tap into. Like I said, the Eastern Sound was, there was not a lot of fishing pressure at the time. A lot of the bottom was, a lot of the wrecks and stuff were not fished yet, undiscovered. And so when you found a piece, it was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. And yeah, going with all those guys, like the people you just named back in the day, and we had so many wonderful trips. And now, I don't know, it's so sad that right in front of our eyes, we saw that fishery. And listen, we caught a lot of fish, right? I'm not, I was fortunate to, to have an amazing fishery. And we certainly contributed to the demise of the blackfish, but it was such a tiny percent that we were catching and sharing with thousands of customers over the course of the of our, our fishing seasons compared to the pressure that was put on by the potting and all the black market stuff that was going on. And we watched that and would rant and rave at the meetings. I remember seeing you there many years saying, hey, we got to do something about this fishery. Like, we got to preserve this. This fishery had maintained itself as a healthy recreational fishery for decades leading up to the 90s where the price tag was put on the heads of blackfish for live blackfish. And we were watching the pots just blow up year after year, just pots and pots. There was areas where I couldn't even get into anymore because the pots were so numerous. And watching these boats come in and out of the harbor two, three, four times a day with hundreds of blackfish being thrown into these hands and shipped into the city and yeah. and no record of them and the sadly they just did a number on the population and it's never recovered it's well, never you know, recovered Des, i don't see that that level of that quality fishing again it breaks my heart because it, it's absolutely my favorite fishing and um we were lucky we got to enjoy it when it was going on and and i hope it comes back i hope it comes back but it's just a far cry from what it used to be you know what Des? so you and I, we can relate. I was always a tog fisherman, even before I met you. But I always knew that it was just a matter of time. They were, once we started finding them, I just knew, and you knew. And I remember we had a 10-fish limit. Imagine that, folks. It was a 10-fish bag limit. I don't even know if there was a minimum size. But we would go, and Desi would basically wouldn't tell us, but he'd urge us not to keep the 10. And he would talk to me about, we should be keeping four fish. I'm not saying this. Come on, man. Not 10. Now you want to go to four. And you're like, it's going to be a year or two. And there's only going to be four. And it's hard for me. Not hard for me. But when I think about that, We've lived this in such a short time. We have seen this fishery, which was phenomenal. I can remember being a kid at five years old and my father taking me out of Kings Park on a five horsepower freaking Johnson. And I don't care where you stop that boat. You were loading up with blackfish. You were loading up with flounder. You and I, we have seen this thing go from this phenomenal, world-class, one-place-in-the-whole-world fishery to now it's a managed fishery that's being managed to have small fish. I've said that from the beginning. When you have the commercial limit where it's at and you have the potting the way it's happening, our fish are going to average 14 and a half to 17, a big fish is going to be 18. Hopefully, you're going to get that real big one. But when you get that real big one, you almost want to let it go, right, Des? Oh, man, when I see the big ones come up now, I'm like, yeah, I hate when I hate to keep them. I really do. Me too. They're so far and few between. We'll get the occasional 8, 10-pounder, but it's that used to be every day. Oh, it was common. The pool, the pool was always a 10-pounder or eight pounder was nothing back in the day we'd have dozens of them and yeah now you don't see and i i don't know i i don't know a couple of years we had some great short life 
And there was some optimism. Maybe there's a new class coming through, but you know, they did start finally after 20 years of this fishery getting pounded. They finally started with tags the last couple of years, yes. which was a, a good they, step. Yes. But we were asking for that years ago. If oh. they just started with tags, maybe it could have slowed down the black market. I mean, I remember being in the fisheries meetings and they would say the commercial, the recreational fishermen account for 90% of this fishery yeah. and therefore we have to cut them back or whatever. And I'm like, there's a, I could literally tell you uh, certain <laughs> ports and whatnot that single handedly one or two commercial uh, guys on the black market were count were accounting for thousands of blackfish just oh, right yeah. there and none of it was being recorded it was all under the table and of course none of that makes it into the data with which they decide our regulations and therefore they the problem was never addressed they was focusing on the recreational which i was fine having limits on the recreational side, that was all good. But the fact that they just let the free for all continue while they caught us back was, it was yes. like, we were just we screaming. We see that our, in uh, every fishery. Think about it. They're doing it to us I, right now in fluke. They're doing it to us right now in sea bass. It's look, the fishery was fine for centuries, not Decades, centuries, until they found a way to catch them in pots. Hook and line fishermen are not the reason that those fish have left. We always caught them on hook and line. And, oh, yeah, people are going to go, oh, we got sonar now. So we found them. That's not what did it. What did it is what I just saw yesterday. You might know this. But right now. Live blackfish in some Korean markets or Asian markets in the city are going for twenty five dollars a pound. Twenty five. Oh you catch a ten fish, ten pound fish is two hundred fifty bucks, and they're getting it. I have the video. I've seen it. I know it's happening. I don't say anything unless I know it's for real. And how are the fish going to make it at that value? How are they going to make it? They're not. A few things need to be done, which you know. The, the, uh, the potting size and the recreational size needs to be changed. Needs to be at least the same. If not, I think that the commerce comms should be a little bit higher, but I, I don't even want to go there. But when you think about it, it's not the wreck angler that destroyed that fishery. And now we have this fishery that's going to have just like striped bass. We're going to end up just having a bunch of keepers for everybody. And the day of the big fish, sadly, is over unless we make some serious changes. Yeah, and it breaks my heart, George, because like you, I cherished black fishing uh, and it built my business i'll always be grateful for having fished the years that i did and i just i don't even know what, what to say it's a helpless feeling watching it slowly get worse and worse every year and now for us it's amazing back in the day on the moons and stuff when things were a little slower if we caught 50 60 keepers so that was our slow trip. And I only took 25 guys out at the time. 50 keepers was our slow day. And we tell them, I'll oh, come back off the moon. It'll be good again. <laughs> now I think about 50 keepers is, is our normal decent day now. We catch 50 keepers. We're happy. It, that's our good trip now. It's just, it's unbelievable. And, but I don't and know our lifetime, happen. do you feel that oldness? <laughs> do you feel like... You've been around that long that the change should be as drastic as it is, or did it happen so much faster than you ever expected? I I don't know because I've watched so many other fisheries thrive at the same time. So, for example, sea bass fishing has been extraordinary, and it's gotten better. And we're at 16 and a half inches this year, 
and we're still going out and catching a hundred keepers and limiting out the boat. I limit two days ago. I was out That's and great. we limited out the boat with beautiful. We were throwing them back. We had too many. We couldn't get away from them. I had to leave the drop. I had 50 foot of sea bass underneath the boat. If I showed you a screenshot, you'd blow your mind how many sea bass there were. So we never used to have that in the sound. When I was a kid working on the boats, if we caught two or three sea bass for the trip that were 12 inches, we were happy. Oh, yeah. So, so you watch other fisheries thrive, like sea bass and porgies. Porgy fishing is as good as it's ever been. Fantastic. Thank God for porgies and sea bass because that's become the mainstay of our business. And people still can come out and they can fill a bucket of fish and the kids catch and the families catch. And that's been our staple. I miss the fluking and the black fishing, but thank God at least we have the great bottom fishing. So those are doing great. And striped bass fishing this year was the best I've ever seen it. The amount of striped bass in Long Island Sound this year was more than I've seen in my entire life. It was amazing. And coincidentally, they cut that back to a three-inch slot this year when there's more bass than anyone knows what to do with. Well, you um, know what, Des? You've got to listen to a couple of my what... past podcasts. You are joining the choir here because everyone's saying the same thing. And if you want to hear my take on it, I don't care if you want to hear it or not. I'm going to give it to you. Well, so, <laughs> no, so you can say whatever you want. <laughs> So here's the way I see it. It, it. I mean, look, fisheries management lacks common sense. I say it all the time. So it's only common sense. So the flukes seem to be moving. Maybe they're going north. We don't know. They're, they're, everything's moving. All of a sudden, we got these sea bass. We never had them. The other cold water fish seem to be leaving a little bit. I don't know. They may be moving. And, you know, now... Here we are with this great sea bass fishery, which we never had before. And now we have more striped bass than we ever had before. But I'm not sure if you know this or not, but I'm on top of this whole thing. We are going to see a total moratorium next year in the spring for striped bass. Get ready. It's coming. You haven't heard it. I'm telling you, Des, you know, I'm always right there. And I'm telling you, it's going to be a moratorium. The, and let me tell you why. Here's where the common sense goes out the window. So the numbers in the YOY, the young of the year, the small ones that they find in the Chesapeake are like non-existent. There are no, the YOY is falling off the planet. Down there. So what does that tell you? Don't tell me. Our striper fishery is better than it's ever been. We've seen, you're seeing them on the East End. Imagine what that New York bite is saying. So we're going to, we're going to end up in a moratorium. We basically fish a moratorium. It's 28, 31 inches. Your shot's one out of a hundred. Get one of those suckers. But they are going to eliminate that. To save the Chesapeake Bay. Now, what is what does the spring fishery in New York, the spring fishery in New York, have to do with the Chesapeake? Nothing. Nothing. None of our fish here are going to Chesapeake. They're here and they're staying here. But because of I don't know, crazy management, no no common sense management. Desi, I'm afraid you're going to hear about a, and starting to think now I'm listening, and they may just make it a Western shutdown. So all of those boats, all of those guys that have been practicing catch and release, and they just go out there to catch those fish and let them go, hoping to get that 28, 31-inch Lottery slot fish, they're all going to be shut down. You tell me how a John McMurray with all his boats, and there's so many of them carrying in. I go on and on. They live on that fishery. They're going to shut it down for no reason. I hope I'm wrong. I think I'm right. And you're going to see it out there? 
tragic if they did that. And I liken it to the collapse of the lobster fishing in Long Island Sound. Right. <clears throat> when I started my business, there used to be 25 boats out of Mount Sinai Harbor alone, in and out every day, thriving lobster fishery. And then something happened, not sure what, climate change, the, the, the pesticide spraying, something killed the lobsters, and they're no longer there. But the lobster fishery, everything was shifting north there, and lobsters were at the southern end of their range. This particular species, perhaps the water just warmed up too much. Nobody knows, right? right. But the lobster fish up north in Maine was still extremely good. But what? imagine they shut down the lobster fishing up in Maine because Long Island Sound was now depleted. It, That's basically what they're doing with the striped bass and exactly. everything that you're saying. Well, because it's true. Long Island Sound no longer has lobsters, therefore we can't fish for lobsters trap lobsters in, in in maine anymore it just makes no sense no no and, and what happens if everything else the striped bass which they have gotten the yoy numbers in the chesapeake every year now what happens if they moved out of there they're moving north they're somewhere else they're not where they look they go to look for them so we can't fish until they somehow find these fish? I'm telling you, nobody knows better than you. We've been through it all. But think about it, Des. Has time gone that fast? Think about what we had and where we are. I can remember getting on Pete Pearson's party boat, 200 bucks a head. We would run to the canyon. And we would load up on bluefin and we would come home. That's over. Everything is that we did then is over. But something else is taking it back. Now, me, myself, I would much rather fight a blackfish, but I'd much rather eat a sea bass. I would be fine. If, if, we, if these sea bass numbers stay, I'll be fine. But I'm a firm believer, Des. I don't know if you know this, but I've done a lot of homework on it. In fact, I have a podcast on it. We have an estimated 1.1 million pots that are laying, that are ghost pots that are laying on the bottom of New York Sound, Long Island Sound. Think of that. Over a million pots, ghost pots. Now, we know after they did, did all the cleanup, they did a massive cleanup the last couple of years. Yeah, you know what they got? 17,000. And all of the pots that they got from the lobstermen that left the pots there, they just went back and got them, got paid for. Them. But as right. of right now, I, I can't remember the guy's name, he's the greatest guy ever. He's out there trying to get these pots and they're getting them at, the, at a rate of 10 to 15,000 a year. There's a million of them. Do you know that they told me they finally, they just got side scanned to find these pots? They just got side scans sonar. How long have you had that? Really? They just got it this year. So, so wow. think about it. If there's one blackfish, and you, I'm sure you've encountered some pots. If there's one blackfish in each pot, it's a million fish. A million. Yeah. Look, there's a lot we could do. I'm glad, though, that you've got those porgies and you got those sea bass. And what happened with bluefish this year over there? Let me just make one more comment about the sea bass. Go ahead. Because it, it absolutely boggles my mind. The amount of sea bass we run into, especially out of Mattituck in the eastern sound this time of year, it. Like I said, if I sent you a screenshot from the other day, there was literally thousands and thousands of them on one wreck. Wow. And I just caught a tiny little bit of it. I, it and it's <laughs> funny because you and then and the herd moves so you can go back the next day and it's blank. But when you run into these herds of fish, like I, I just wish I could grab the fishery scientists and be like, come here, count now. Yeah, <laughs> really? It's like. On this one spot, <laughs> underneath the boat, I'll send you a screenshot when we're done. You'll just, you'll, 
you won't believe it. And their it's whole view spot. will change. And, yeah. Yeah. And it's, they don't realize the amount of, and that's just my one little spot. I'm literally thousands of fish. I'll be in a hundred feet of water and they'll read from the, all the way top to bottom through the whole water column. See that is crazy. And we've been running into these schools now for a couple of years. And it's amazing when you find them, the whole boat limits out, you catch double headers and they're big. And even at 16 and a half inches, we're still able to catch a limit. And thank God for that. And it's really, that is a, as epic as sea bass. Like you remember back in the winter fishery going on the big Jamaica and stuff. Out oh, in yeah. Town, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Now we do that in freaking Long Island Sound, which <laughs> I never thought that would happen, but that's been an incredible evolution of that fishery and where mother nature giveth and taketh away. And right now she's really hooked us up with that one. And that's really gets people going and, and makes the trip worthwhile. And, Hey, if you can catch a couple of blackfish, but then you go put half a dozen beautiful big sea bass in the cooler, it makes for a good day. So that's what's keeping us going, and it's making for good a good product here, and the people are, are very happy with it, and, and that's keeping us going. But uh, again, I sometimes when they tell us these numbers, I just want to run my own survey and, and bring them out and have them see what I see in Long Island Sound. And we're not even at the epicenter where the sea bass population migrates. We're just catching the fringe that comes into Long Island Sound here. And that's how abundant they are. And I remember, and porgies as well. I remember one day, George, with my side scan sonar that I had on my boat, I had a school of porgies that ran along the edge of one of the shoals when they came in spawning. And the the school of fish was like 15 to 20 feet high off the bottom, but about at least 100 to 150 feet across when I picked it up with with my sonar, right? And I was like, wow, let me keep seeing how long this school runs for. And I followed the contour line of the shoal, and I ran for a solid mile scanning this school that was, again, 150 feet width by 20 feet high and a mile long until I finally reached the end of the school. And I reckon there had to be be probably the upwards of a million fish there easily. If you think about it, it was, and that was just in one hour. And you're like, how do they quantify this? And then tell us, and you know, that was the day that they restricted the regulations that year because (laughs) We there wasn't enough of them, and they had cut us. I don't mean to laugh, but there's times when you're like, "Are you kidding me?" And they're doing it now at the best. That was absolutely one of them. I wanted to literally (laughs) take my screenshots and send it to Noah Fisheries and be like, "What what is going on here?" Des, I went to. I'm the. I'm almost ashamed to say it, but I'm the representative for the recreational angler on weak fish in New York. And I can remember going to a meeting, and it was a year, it was years ago, maybe eight, ten years ago, when the party boats down in New York by the area were getting them pretty good. So I get to this meeting, and I'm looking at the numbers, and the number says that New York totaled 150 pounds of weak fish for the whole year. And I'm looking, and I'm like, I own a fishing magazine. I get fishing reports every day. And I can tell you right now, there were more pounds caught last night in the New York Bite than you have for the whole season here. Those numbers are still there. They're still as they're still part of their their entire how do you want to say it? Their their little course that they have there. I don't know, man. The The numbers are always changing. They never seem to be right. But I got to say one thing. Look, I owned a fish magazine forever, 30 some odd years. I had the first fishing website ever. When I say that to people, they don't believe it. You know for a fact. I, if you put fishing in Yahoo, I was it. I've seen it all. And I got to tell you, Des, I've dealt with... Every business owner there is, 
and so many there there was the guy you wanted to deal with or gal you wanted to deal with they were the ones you dealt with and then there were the ones that you really didn't want to deal with what i want to tell you you were in the top tier you were just you were such a supporter and you helped make me a success i appreciate that george that's really nice to hear and we took care of each other your business absolutely launched my business and i never could have done <clears throat> what i did as a young kid starting out i almost went out of business twice yeah. when i first started because I, I was literally getting fares in to put fuel in my tank so i could fish the next day and then i blew my engine i blew my transmission my sister bailed me out with a loan and but if it wasn't for your sight I'll never forget this. I was doing so bad my first season that I was literally going maybe I'd get out two trips a week when I first started. I'm like, "Oh, this would be easy. You put an ad in the paper and the people will just start coming." But that's not how it works and I would go days and days my phone would not ring. And you had just started your fishing site, thank God. And I was doing so bad I was about to go out of business. cuz I was out of money and I was doing so bad I had to go beg for my old job back running another party boat and then I ended up running uh, another party boat in Port Jeff so I was showing up there running that party boat just to make fuel money so I could run my boat on the weekend wow. with two or three fares that would show up and somehow I managed to make it through the season to blackfish season and i knew i had good blackfish drops lined up cuz i had been searching for them for years and i knew if i could go blackfishing maybe someone would want to come with me and my first day out blackfishing i went out we whaled on i had two customers we whaled on fish and we these two customers were like beside themselves i took pictures whatever and i was like you know what there's this new website norie.com let me go put some pictures up on that website maybe that will help this is way back in the day and i went and posted that night and within i kid you not 15 minutes my phone started ringing and ringing and i'm like whoa <laughs> something just happened here and that next day i somehow or another got eight fares to come with me the next day and we went out again and we whaled on fish again i took pictures of my old digital camera like a 2 megapixel or something like what uh, yeah. the old one yeah where you put the sd card it would take like 20 minutes to upload the pictures <laughs> to, to your website with the little beach ball spinning but i was like i had to do that and after the second day of posting on your site my phone started ringing off the hook and because black fishermen were our crazy bunch oh, and they were so passionate and, and they couldn't believe that wow there's some new boat in Mount Sinai no one had ever heard of them going out and whaling on black fish I got to check this out and then I started getting the calls from all like the the hardcore black fish guys Alberto and and the EC Newman like all these guys that you talk about oh yeah they started hey is this real are you really catching black fish like this cuz there weren't many boats that were hardcore black fishing in those years not at all and and then my I I ended up my next trip because of the posting on your site i was sold out with 25 people and we went out we limited out again whaled on fish took pictures now of 25 people posted those on your site and they all started chatting with each other on your forum telling the fishing stories of how great fishing was and do you know that for the rest of the season i was sold out every single trip every single trip i, I was sold out and i met I don't want to cut you short up but I got to tell you that is one of the most rewarding stories I've ever heard only because <laughs> I really like you as a person and to hear you say that I knew what was going on and no one was admitting it at the time cuz they were afraid I was going to charge them which my my prices were always very inexpensive but to hear you say that it means more to me than anything you could possibly imagine george you have no idea like i i think back about those days and weeks 
I had literally had a day where that fall I had no money. I had blown my transmission. It was like twelve thousand dollars. I literally went to bed that night saying, you know what, I'm done. I at some point you can't keep digging a hole like that. I was tens of thousands in debt. And I went to bed that night and I said, you know what? I tried, whatever, just not meant to be. I'm not going to be a party boat fisherman. I'll do something else. And I woke up that next morning. I don't know what overcame me, but I was like, you know what? I I know I can make this happen. I know I can figure this out. I'm just, I'm freaking going fishing again. And I had two fares again that day. And I just struggled through it up until this moment that I told you with the black fishing in your website. And after after posting those and being sold out like that, it's like the momentum just catapulted. And I got enough money from those final weeks of black fishing, all from Norris.com. <laughs> Or just the crazy black fisherman on your chat forums, just going crazy. It was like madness. I, I could have filled the boat three times over because it was like a starving audience just wanting to go black fishing. And I scrounged enough money together to, to keep the boat going through the winter. And then that spring, we used to have a great spring black fishery as well. So when I started, picked up from that momentum, as soon as I posted on Noreef.com, hey, I'm going to go black fishing again. Boom, the phone started ringing. That's and great. Uh, I, I ended up having a great season and I never looked back. And that next year was the first time that Norris Charter started. And it's hard to think back, like nobody ever did that. It was the first right. time that everyone on your website, and it was arranged by Kilsong, the great Kilsong, the one and only who many of us have fished with over the years, and Mike Marks, Togmaster, and E.C. Newellman, and all these guys who were like, hey, let's all meet each other and get together. And Kilsong that next year arranged the first ever Norris Charter. It was the first one. And everyone met from, came out from behind the keyboard and your screen names. Oh, you're Togmaster, you're Togslayer, you're Fluke, it's whatever everyone's name was, right? And met on my boat for the most epic trip. And we were so fortunate. This was, pr- if I had to pick one day as a fisherman that I could relive, it would probably be this one. But yeah, Kilsong, it was the first ever Kilsong Norris charter. Okay, and- now <clears throat> I'm going to add something to this that's going to make it even, I believe, that much more special. As we had that food, remember, we had the soup going. Everybody was freaking out. I had that big bowl of soup in the middle of of the boat. And my brother was there, God rest his soul. And it turns out that was his last trip he ever fished. And I don't know if you recall, but he went out. He fished for five minutes. He was working the whole time getting the food ready. And my brother fished for five minutes. And he won the pool with an 11-pound blackfish. He beat out John Skinner. You saying that, it really means that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer in faith and it means a lot to me, you saying that. There's, there's a lot to that trip. Yeah, that trip was so special because, again, all these people were united for the first time through it was the when the internet was still somewhat pure and a positive force oh it was so the, beautiful then you know, before all the freaking tiktok nonsense and all this other crap that and the algorithms that make us hate each other like all this nonsense back in the day we just were fishermen connecting and and enjoying our passion and learning from one another and making new friends i made so many friends through Norris.com oh, back yeah. in the day. But yeah. that particular trip, we were blessed with, it was 70, it was November 1st. I still have it in my logbook. Never it's November forget 1st. It. And it was 70 degrees. We were fishing in short sleeves. I went to a virgin wreck that I had never fished before. We caught 300 keepers and then some, and it was flat calm. And we had the best day. And all these fishermen got to know each other. 
And then we had, I was Killsong's buddy was a sushi chef, remember? And then Oh, man, the he stuff. was cutting and that stuff up. Oh. A beautiful tray of sashimi for everyone. Oh, my God. Neil was there. Captain Neil filmed that with his freaking camcorder back in the day. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's still, still out there been... fishing, I hear. Yeah, yeah, he came out with me this year. But when I look back at all those faces and we're like, God, we only knew how special that was. That uh, was the first of many phenomenal Northeast charters. Uh, dozens of Northeast charters and many other different charter masters started up over the, in the, that season um, for the next 10 years, it was like reached its peak in its heyday. And that was such a huge part of my business, not only for black fishing, but fluke fishing. We had tons of fluke charters and like the, the whole Northeast community just, just came together in those years. And it was just a remarkable time, but that's what got me over the hump. When you start a business, like you, you, a lot of businesses really struggle and that's why they go out of business. They just can't make that Critic, they can't reach critical a uh, point where the the money coming in is more than the money going out. When you gotta just fold them, but it's not easy. Yeah, it was. It, it wasn't easy, but I'm so thankful to have had that opportunity, and it was great working with you all those years, George. Like I say, you relied on us boats for bringing content to your site, and very much we received in return tenfold in in business on helping us grow and get the word out and. It was amazing. The whole thing was amazing how it happened back in the day. Well, you know what? We be <laughs> became family. We really did. We all knew each other. We were all in a... For we you mentioned Larry. You knew who it was. Like, we were all on a first-name basis. You became... Look, there were plenty of boats that would love to have had the Norris crowd. But when I when we met you and we fished with you, we knew this is the guy we want to talk fish with from here on out yeah. and fluke fish with and do whatever we got to do. And I, I can only say I, I keep saying it, but I really mean it. It's hard for me to believe that it's all gone by. And it happened so fast, and the change that has occurred in our um, lifetime, or not in our lifetime, but in our time in this fishery. Yeah, I, it seems like a dream, you know, that back in the day. I yeah. mean, I remember and when we first started that, I we didn't have smartphones. No. <laughs> like I said, I would go out. I had maybe like I had like a Nextel like flip phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we we would take pictures on the original digital cameras and then pull out the SD cards, insert them into the computer at night, and upload. It was like I think back about. I remember the first time someone showed me a phone where they could pull up a marine forecast on their phone, and I was like, wow. Yeah, wow, I re yeah. I remember a time you guys would grab our phones. We weren't allowed on a freaking party, but give me your phone. Why? You're going to mark my spot? No. Oh. In the beginning, we actually had to give up our phones. I don't, you might That might have been before you, but there was actually a time where we were not allowed to hold our own phones. Oh, my God. Yeah, well, it started with handheld GPSs and then went to phones, and now... Forget it. I've had so many spots mugged. That there, now there's a map of the bottom you can buy for 25 bucks with an app. It's like there are, forget it. There are no, see, and Des, you can put them on the spot, show them where it is, tell them what to do, and they won't catch a thing and they'll never go back. So you got nothing to worry about. That's yeah, been I, my I, experience. I miss the days fishing with Loran when it actually took some skill to be able to get on a piece and, and go black fishing. Now it's so easy with spot locks and everything else, but uh, that, that, that's a whole other issue. Yeah. Is that we'll talk about that some <laughs> other day. All right, Des, yeah. look, I, you know, I want to close this out with you knowing that you've always been special to me and your entire operation. I've always had a ton of respect for and as I do for many of the guys and gals that 
you know, do what you do. It's every other business. It's a crapshoot from one day to the next. Only you have to deal with some real crazy stuff. You got regulations that you never know is what the hell is going to come up. You got fuel, you got docking, you got insurance, you got your boat blowing up, you got God knows what. And then on top of that, you got crazy regulations. But the good people that are good business people, which I know you are able to make it through. And, you know, I'm so glad that you were able to make a, a career out of what you enjoyed. Thank you, George. And and many people helping me along the way, like yourself and your business. And by the grace of God, go I. Like I've been so, so lucky to do this as a living. And it's been a great career. It's been a hard career. There's definitely a lot of sleepless nights and moments of frustration. And just when you think you're catching up, Mother Nature keeps you tied to the dock with crappy weather for a week like we had this fall or whatever. But it's a labor of love. And every day I still get on the boat with a smile on my face as we steam out to the grounds. And I pinch myself and say, man, I'm one lucky guy that this is what I get to do with my life. Yeah, it's been nice sharing that journey with you for sure. And I look forward to going fishing again. I'll be there. Be here, be it here or in sunny Florida one day or wherever. You got it, Daz. Look, this was great. I wish you nothing but the best. Make sure you mohawk the fish. And if, look, I don't tell everyone that I'm snowbirding down here in Florida, but I am now. So if you (laughs) happen to be down in Naples, look me up. And anyone listening, you could do that too. I may not answer right away, but in Desi's case, I'm answering. (laughs) George. All right, brother. You take care of yourself. And this was great. All right, George, take it easy. Thanks so much for having me on your show. Hey, thank you so much for being on the show. All right, take care, George. Our story today is more than just a tale of fishing. It's a saga of the human spirit, of fighting against the tide and finding hope in the most unexpected places. We've journeyed from the brink of despair with engines failing and debts mounting to the thrill of a phone ringing with promise. Remember the days of the near silence, broken only by the hopes that someone somewhere would answer the call. And then the transformation, Norris.com, not just a website, but a lifeline, a, a platform that connected us, that brought our stories to the world. Each picture posted, each story shared became a beacon calling to a all of our fellow anglers, from the first successful blackfish trip to the phone ringing off the hook. It was a journey of rediscovery, of realizing that our passion could indeed be our livelihood. And then the Norris Charter, a gathering that transcended the digital realm, bringing together a community of anglers united, not just by a website, but by a shared passion that runs as deep as the ocean itself. We remember all of our great members, architects, and all the many friendships that blossomed on the Celtic Quest. There's a certain magic in these memories, a reminder that amidst the turmoil of the world, the simple joy of fishing, of sharing a bowl of soup in a boat, can bring us closer than we ever imagined. We recall the triumphant catch of my beloved brother, a moment etched in time, a testament to the unexpected gifts that the sea bestows upon all of us. As we cast our thoughts back to those days of unity and discovery, let's hold on to the sense of wonder that feeling of being part of something larger than ourselves. The world may change. Technologies may evolve. But the heart of fishing, the soul of our community, remains unshakable. So as we sign off from this episode, let's carry these stories with us as reminders where we've been and as beacons guiding us to where we're headed. Until we meet again, 
This is George, your captain, on this journey through the waves and wonders of New York sport fishing. Keep your lines tight, your hearts open, and your memories alive. Thank you for listening to the New York Angler Podcast. You can find more on fishing New York waters at nyangler.com, your secret spot online.